All right, so today we'll look at uh, views and layouts. Um, that is the topic for that module, but the assignment is just not gonna be about views. Of course, about coding and how many things work as well. So I highly recommend that I notice the chapters here may not be in perfect, perfect alignment with the text, but um, the views and the layouts are actually covered in chapter three and four. Um, I apologize for that um, uh, inconsistency, but make sure you go to uh, those chapters and look at the details, how um, you actually build your views, okay? they have. I think the author did a pretty good uh, example using the different layouts in there. So we're gonna do a couple of them in class, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on that um, because we're gonna focus on other features as well. Okay, so in here, um, let's see, what do we have here? I have any notes here. Yeah, so we're gonna take a look at um, a toast, a little pop-up message you see on your Android device. You know, uh, uh, so that is a toast. Um, we'll also look at the log cat. You might have seen that already, but we'll take a look at that and why is that important and how do you use that in your program? Mainly just for, uh, you know, debugging purposes, basically. So I think, yeah, we looked at this last time, right? How how they all connected together. Okay, so make sure you study this diagram, understand how they work. Every layout, okay, like the layout here, even though it's an XML file, it will actually convert that to an object. So everything in Android is basically object, like in Java, right? So not only that, every component will control you, add into your layout will also be converted to object. Like a text view, we, we wrote a tag, but it will be rendered into object, like a web page, same idea. Okay, here is another diagram. I wanted to, um, I can make this bigger. All right, so here is just a high overview of all the objects, or these are basically classes. There's a lot of them you see here. So if you trace, you know, all the way in the far right, the bottom to the top, you're gonna see that, of course, the, the super, super class object, always the object class, very similar to many languages, Java, you know, JavaScript, C, same thing. But everything here you see are uh, subclasses of the view class. So everything you can say is a view, okay? And then under the view, you have different types of controls. So everything in blue here are usually the controls, like the elements or the things that you see on the on the uh, on the um, the UI, okay? The, the one in orange over here are basically layouts, okay? Layouts, a different con container that can contain other layouts and also contain other views or objects, okay? And uh, so all of these views are uh, a sub um, classes of the super class called view group. So everything here is under the view group, okay? But certainly you can nest you know, most of these views and other views as well, because they're all part of the view group, okay? Um, so as you can see, there are a lot of them. We haven't, you know, learned them all, and I don't think we're gonna learn them all anyway. This, that's just too many. But you see this absolute layout. So if you look at the view group over here, like the very parent um, group, at the fragment, we'll look at the fragment, uh, maybe another break come, maybe a little bit later in the, in, in the uh, semester. The um, I think you did the spinner in your first assignment, right? We did a little bit of that. Uh, Liz and Grid V will do this in the next couple of weeks as well. It's really, really interesting, very important. Um, they are part of the adaptive view. So again, if later on, if you don't understand what's going on in the code, come back to this diagram. You can, you can kind of see why we're using the adaptive view to create grid or list views. Okay, these two are important because you are able to generate these views dynamically as you go, okay? Um, so we have the, uh, the frame layout and then the grid layout and then under the grid layout, well, over here we have like the linear layout, which is the one that we use quite a lot because it's the easiest, I, in my opinion, it's the easiest to use. Everything you, you add to the layout is like the stack on top of one another, either uh, horizontally or vertically, right? It's easy to do that. Okay, so let's go back here. And so we, I think we, we know this already. Um, so let's go up here. This one here, I don't remember what this one is. Okay, so another another note I put here, I basically again pulled this up on the textbook. I just basically grab the things that um, may be relevant or important in this um, course. So like a text view, how you would create one using code like this, using the tag, and then uh, 
uh, the classes they are, are derived from, right? So everything everything is under the view class that you can see over here. And then there is an edit view. You did that in assignment two, where you type a name or type a text. You read that text information, and then you submit that to the first activity. It's for input only. Um, we have the button, very common. So the first three are quite common, right? Input text, the text to display data, and then the button. Those are three most common ones. Uh, and so forth. Okay, so this list here is kind of interesting because it also shows you you can actually add images to your buttons. We haven't done that before, but you can replace it with text or include both of them, like you see here, right? We would add images to that, and again, try it out when you, when you get a chance under the um, attribute called drawable here. So drawable right, left, button, top, just the location or how you would place that uh, image in your button, in the location, and you can add text to it, right? So as well, um, you just have to add this icon inside the drawable folder, okay? So that's a thing that you can try it out. Um, again, it's another one for image only. Image, it's a button, but it's only image, there's no text, right? So a, a lot of cool stuff in here. And again, try it out when you get a chance, okay? So back here, um, a toast, just very quickly, we'll, we'll do examples. And I highly recommend that you go to this site to look at some of the things um, that we have not, we don't cover in the class, and we'll cover most of them, but not a lot of them anyway. So a toast really is just a um, like a notification, a little pop-up um, message that appears on the um, on your device, like on the bottom here, right? So you, this is useful when, let's say, you have a form or um, you have certain kind uh, a, a thing a feature that you want to display to the user, or if the user did not include or did not complete the form or something you want to throw a message instead of throwing right directly to the form you can show this little pop-up message saying hey you need to fill in your first name right and that will go away after like a you know a couple of seconds okay so that is what the toast is for and there's another one called snack bar but we're not going to do that because that's a little bit difficult all right so um i want to go back to uh the unit two assignment and uh, just to clarify a few things. And again, thanks, Oscar, for letting me know about that error. If you have not done yet, you might not understand what I'm talking about. But if you complete this assignment, and towards the end of this assignment here, down here where we have, um, so basically you send data over to the other activity. So the second activity sees the data and it sends, it sends the information back to the first activity. And then the first activity is going to receive that information so right around here, initially, right, so you would start the activity like normally we, we did this last time. Again, I'll, I'll review this in the code. You would send it over. And then the second activity would send it and tend to back again, and you retrieve that. Okay, you would treat that and you process that information. Uh, a different way to do that is using what's called the start activity for result. I'll make this bigger, let's see. Okay, this is a different approach as opposed to this. This, the first one here, means that I'm going to send the intent over to another activity and it can do its thing. It can return or not. I don't really care. It might, you know, navigate to a third activity and, and so, so on, right? So it just keep going that way. So the second type here is that if you intend to ensure that this second activity, which you are calling, so you are the caller, right? I'm calling a second activity to do something, and then when it's done, I'm expecting that same activity to come back, okay, to return something back. So in, in a way, return a result back to me. So in that way, you will call this function instead of the first one. So this one here, you're expecting something to return, so you will call that. And when you call this function, then on the way back, on the trip back, it's going to automatically invoke another function called uh, the unactivity result. So we override that super class function, and this is fired automatically when you call this function from the caller, okay? If you don't call it, then this is not gonna get fired, okay? It's uh, it's an automatic thing. So it, it tracks it, okay, I'm expecting this intent from activity two to come back. When it comes back, I'm gonna fire this and then get the data. As you can see, we get the data from the intent the intent data, you're still going to call that to get the data using the username as the code. And then you do something with that information. Okay. So this is the old way how to do things. Um, 
not that really old, but I think about a year ago. So they determined that they're going to probably, you know, get away from using this approach. And the reason why is because this activity here, you know, <clears throat> once you send that over, right? What if that activity two never comes back? What if you actually went out to a third activity and that third activity might send something back, it might trigger this function to run and you get the incorrect information. Okay, because it's an independent function, right? So instead of doing it that way, then what they did was they would actually pass in a callback function. But um, again, it's kind of beyond the scope of this class, but I will show you in a way later in my code. Uh, if, I, if I don't have time, I'll share with you so you can see how that works, okay? So just make sure if you see that, and uh, if this, the uh, studio said, this is, hey, this is deprecated, it doesn't mean that it's not working. This should still work, okay? So you just ignore that um, warning. Okay, I put a note here. If you had the old uh, uh, notes, you, uh, the old assignment, you might have seen this, but I just updated this like the other day. So I'm just saying that this is a different way how you can register event to a control. Okay, so this is a button, right? We declare the button here through the ID, and then we set an event listener, right? It's a click event listener to this button. And when this button's clicked, it's going to invoke this, and inside here, we pass in, this is what's called the anonymous inner class. So it has no name, right? You can instantiate a new object in here. Inside the object here is what this onClick handler is. Okay, so the function is you know, within this anonymous class. And then you proceed in here, do the coding here. The other way is you attach directly to the click event, which is this guy right here, right? Through the XML. So that's just a different way how to approach it. Uh, the same idea for, you know, if you were to uh, register an event to a button on a web page, okay? You can go through the code or you can go through the actual um, UI itself, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and um, fire up our app. Oh, this is Oscar's. I was testing your app last week, Oscar, because... Um, it was not working in the system is so it's just because i think these systems have an older version of java so if you were to work this on a higher uh, version of java and if you were to use that on a lower version of java then it would not work so ideally these computers should be upgraded to the latest version of java but i think it's still kind of like old version so here we're using java 11 in these computers and right now uh the app that uh, oscar created or at home is actually in java 17. And I think we're actually far more than that now. We're like a Java 21 now, I think. Yeah. So yeah, right. So every six months, this new version coming out. Um, so it's updating very fast. So we're kind of behind, behind this classroom. So uh, anyway, let's close this. And we're going to open the one that we created last week. So you don't have to waste uh, a lot of time. This is uh, from unit two last time. Let's give it a try. Um, but we did last time, like we, we go to target and then it comes back and then um, basically we update the message here, okay? So last what we did was we send that over to the target, right? And then it sends the intent back. Notice we start the activity, just send that back to wherever it is. We don't care whether it comes back or not. And then we pass in the message with the target uh, key of the string here from the button. And then on the main activity, remember that we have to check to make sure that there is an intent and then the data coming back is uh, indeed has some data and not a null value. Otherwise, um, we want to, um, if it's not null, we want to overwrite the message with the new message here. So that's what we do last time. And you, you do this way because, um, you know, you don't know who or what activity is sending the data back. So you would check it this way. It's not going to trigger automatically uh, using the other function. <clears throat> I'm going to go to the activity layout uh, for the number one, so you can see easily. And let's go back to this uh, layout here. So again, we use the linear layout. We can start with this one here. Linear means like you you cannot have um, like I cannot have these two buttons adjacent to each other. I cannot put over here, right? 
it won't let me because everything is linearly. I chose to be in vertical because if you click on the layout, we, it says vertical here. You can see that. But over here, we chose the orientation of the vertical. So it can only fit one control per line. That's what it, that's what it means. So if I want to have these two buttons aligned below that, you know, next to each other, because it has a lot of real estate here, it's been wasted. How do you fix that? Okay. Um, in order to fix that, you can add another layout. If I go to layout here, I can add another, uh, I want the horizontal layout, linear layout, I can drag that, put it right below the hello, like that. Okay, it's, it's kind of big, but you can see down there. Or you can see over here also, and I want to drag this button to that layout, okay, the both of them into the layout. So you can see on the tree is nested under the layout. So now you see that they are nested beneath that and they're adjacent to each other. So I nested another layout, which is a linear layout, inside of another linear layout, just so that my buttons are nicely uh, um, organized this way. But they're not centered. So again, I click on the layout, the one up here. I'm going to change the, uh, the gravity to, uh, I think, center again. Okay, let's see if that works. So now they're center at the bottom. Um, and, and this is, it takes a lot of space to make it quite big, right? Because the size of this layout is pretty big. You can see here, it takes the whole real estate here. What if you want to get small? You can resize it manually like this so that it will just take that much space. Right, so it looks a little bit better, you can see. And they are adjacent to each other. I need some, you know, margins around that. You can go to the actual buttons themselves and add margins, okay? Under the transforms here, you can have some stuff and you can actually change as well. You can rotate this if you want to. Um, again, may not apply to all different controls, but um, play with this, okay? But the margin, you can have some space around it. I can make it bigger, smaller, but it's all, uh, it's all uh, there together. So again, I can't find it. Just search for margin. Hopefully it should show up. So here's the margin here, the layout margin. <clears throat> so I want the uh, the left, right, right. Like that, if you want just on all four layout, then you put here, I think like four, see, four DP. You can see that it's all around, I think. And then the same thing over here, right? You add another one here for like uh, for PSL. So in a way, I mean, if you just look at it, it looks nice. So what do you have another row of layouts? So you can add another linear layout below that and so forth. You can nest other layouts inside the layouts. But again, you have to take uh, into account that the more nested layouts you have, the more time consuming for the Android OS system to render and create them, okay? It looks nice and easy, uh, but then it, is not, it may not be efficient. So another one you can have is, you can go over here to the, let's go over here to the layout, and I'm gonna copy the main activity, just copy it, Control C, Control V right back in there, and give it a name, I'll call it main two. Just so you know that you can have as many layouts as you want, okay? So this layout, the main, the main points to the main activity. The main two also points to the main activity. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which uh, uh, one you point it to. You can have many layouts that can map to a single class if you choose to, but a, a class can only map out to a single layout. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you in the class, you have to pick one layout. You cannot render two layouts at once. You have to pick one. But in your layouts, you can have different versions of your layouts. The reason why you might have a couple of versions is because, what will be a reason why you have multiple layouts? I will lay out one and two, they point both to the main. Why would I have two versions like that? Any any idea? Okay, um, it, it's like this, let me show you. What happens, is my device still running? Okay. What happens if I do um, if I do this, right? When you change your orientation, your controls either stick like that or they have to re rearrange a different layout, right? So in this way, 
you can have multiple different layouts for based on the orientation of your of the device. If it's rotated this way, maybe my second layout will be rearrangement of, of my controls. Okay, so that is one reason why you have multiple layouts. And maybe you want to have a different layout for a really tiny screen or really big screens. Uh, you want to have um, you can you want to add more controls to the screen because now you're using like a TV screen now, right? So you have multiple layouts to fit a di different device. And we're not going to do that now, but maybe in, in the future, if you have time, you can actually write code in your activity here to detect the devices that a user has. And based on that device or even the orientation, then you can set this to run certain layouts. If it's landscape, then run activity main. If it's a portrait, then run activity main two. Right? If the device is uh, a TV, then activity main three and so forth. Right? So that's why you have multiple versions. But again, one class can only load one layout, but your layouts can have can be mapped to many, many different kinds. Okay, so I just want to um, throw that out there just in case you may wonder why. So look at the main layer too, okay? So we see that, let me do this way to have more space. And sometimes, I mentioned last time that we, this is actually cleaner, you can see it better, but if you want to design using a different uh, layout, especially constraint layout, then you want to go back to the blueprint. Okay, the blueprint here, sometimes it's better when you just lay out content. You don't care about, I mean, you don't care about the content, will lay out your controls. Okay, it, it shows you the outline of each of those controls better than the other layout. If you look at, if you put the both of them, you will see that this one here, it always shows you the outline of your controls. Here, you don't see that unless you hover over that, you will see it, but here it gives you a really nice view. I'm gonna go change this layout, okay? The original one uses the linear layout. And we're gonna change the, linear, the, the layout too to something completely different. So let me go and move this back out to the original uh, layout because we're gonna destroy the second layout. Okay, and we will try to re regenerate the same layout like the other one using the constraint. Okay, so this is uh, the second linear, I'm gonna delete that. I'm gonna change the linear layout to back to the constraint. So again, constraint layout. Right. Okay, <clears throat> so here we go. Constraint layout. If you compare this to this view, right, this is like kind of center in the middle, and this uh, center below that, right, that one, right below that text. So how would you do that using the constraint layout? Let me move this to the top, so it's kind of in that order before. Because now everything's like all stacked on the top left using the constraint. And you can move them around, right, like you see here, okay? Right now, there are no constraints because they did not drag. If you don't see all those like uh, those, uh, zigzag lines, meaning they're free from constraints. And also, if you actually be up here, you, you see this little message. I don't know how to see that again. But the red line just saying that these have no constraints. So I want to constrain this to the left. So you drag this to the left, the arrow, and then drag to the right. So now they, it's suspended in the middle. So now it's centered right, vertically. But, but it's still being free to move up and down like this. So if you want this to be centered, then same thing, right? You want to drag the top all the way to the top of the, the view and then drag the bottom all the way to the bottom. So now it's suspended, centered in the screen. Right, so now it's locked in there. It's like a rubber band. Now, what about these two? So I don't want to add a, 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 a linear layout. You can't, you want to, right? But I want to do it without it. So again, you would drag this to the bottom, put it right below here. And I want to I want them to be right here. Okay, so they are next to each other. The left is constrained to this button. Okay, so so now they are like they are synchronized. If I move this, you can see that it can this one controls the other one. If I move it, it moves the other one with it. But it does not move up and down. It only controls the left and right because it only has the left constraint attached to this button. So it's limited to this button. It will never pass. This button cannot go over that button. If I try to drag it over, it won't let me do it. Okay, so it has a constraint set against that button. <clears throat> and then I want this button to be have constraint on the left side like this. Okay, same thing over here. Okay, so they're now kind of suspended together. 
But this one here has no constraint on the right side. So again, you would probably do this and attach to uh, this one here. Oh, oh, actually, did I lose it? Uh, it won't let me do here. Let me see. But I'll go to the right. Yeah, it's really strange how you can do this, but so I, I suspended this all the way to the left and right. Okay. But this one here, the left is, you know, um, constrained to the size of this bun, the right of this. So this one can never go past that. What about the, what about center, top and bottom? And so the top, I want this to go right below this. And then this one here, let's see if it does the same thing. Okay, so they are suspended below that. So if I move this one here, it controls all three of them, right? Because now they're constrained against this Hello World text. So that now if I look at my layout, it looks kind of very similar to my original one, right? But without having a nested layout, <clears throat> because now it's, it's I'm using the rubber band. Right, the suspension here. So I can resize this to kind of have how I like it. If you click on the Hello World one, you see that on the layout, the constant widget here, it has these four lines. Those lines are these four lines here to suspend it to the edge of this uh, uh, view. But above it has some numbers, okay? There's a, a vertical line and a horizontal lines here. These are um, like, uh, you can also control the biases meaning like you can make it so that it's right now it's like 50 it's 49 but it's pretty close that means a like 50 percent right it, it's like in the middle of this entire layout if you want to move it up so i want to move it to like that i want it to be you know um 30 percent of the screen vertically so it will always be at 30 screen percent at that point. So it doesn't matter what screen size you use, it will always be at that position 30%. Therefore, it will fit to almost any device, right? The position will fix, but then you have to take care about the size of this control. Because right now, we set it to, um, says the width and height is wrapped on the content. So if the content changes, uh, this is gonna go in small. If I change like that, okay, you see that it actually, um, shrinks it down, right? The the constraint is also has bias. This is what we set, like 30% and then almost 50%. is always going to be added 100%. The text size, SP, I don't remember SP is, um, what is, what is it S stand for? Oh, I forgot what it stands for. But the text size is based on SP as opposed to like pixels. Okay, if you go pixel, that means it's fixed. So you want that text size to shrink and grow um, based on your screen size. So I'm just showing you here, you know, uh, how you can actually do to um, using this layout. So if you were to build your um, calculator button, you would do something like this, right? I can just copy and paste this, paste it down, Control C, Control V, and then, you know, move it down and add more and more, and then suspend them all together. What I did here is basically I, I locked the left and right like that, but there's another way you can do that by using what's called chaining. You can chain them together so that they're evenly distributed across uh, horizontally or vertically as well. Okay, uh, that is probably the better approach. Uh, there's so many ways to do it. Um, I'm not a really good designer, so this is not my strength here. Uh, but for those of you who are, you know, if you take the time to really take time to, and learn how to do this, you can build really nice UIs here as well. Uh, so I'll leave that up to you. I'm just going to stop here for the layout. Okay. So again, go back to chapter three and four, look at them, look at the frame layout. Um, a, a couple of them, the frame layout is also interesting because the frame layout lets you stack one layout after another. If you want to add like images to your layout and if you want to put text overlay the, the image, then you want to use the frame layout. Okay. It lets you do that. But um, again, you can still achieve that using um, the constraint layout. Uh, so this is the preferred layout, okay? I know it takes, it takes a lot more to actually design your layout, but 
in terms of performance, this is the best layout. Okay, so this is the uh, two. I'm going to keep this as is, and I'm going to add a radio button. So using the buttons over here, there's a radio button, and there's a, a radio button or radio group. Okay, so if you were just to add a button like this to your control like that, and add another one over here like this, okay, and there is a, there's a, I forgot to do this, there's an automatic um, constraint you can add in here. There's a shortcut, I don't remember exactly which one, but you can add it so it's automatically constrained. But anyway, I'm gonna just do that again, attach it over here, oops, attaches on the right side, uh, attaches to, uh, to this one, this one I'm gonna attach to the right side over here, and then attach it to the right, far right. Okay. And then attaches to uh, to the bottom. Make sure there. If I don't don't do that, then my suspend to the bottom. And I'm gonna do that attaching to the bottom of this one here. Okay. So they kind of like lay out down here. And these two, as you can see, I did not suspend down here. So I probably should have. Um, I should do something like that. And then also this one here. Uh, where is it? I'm confused. I don't want to go to the bottom, but well, that's not it. So which one is the control? This is the, this control is that one. Okay, if I move this, no, if I move this one, Okay, there is a way you can actually control them too. So the top of this can go to the top of that, like that. Uh, it, it depends how you how you do it. It's like like for example, if I try again, if I do this, the arrow, the arrow goes. Is there? See the arrow goes under from the top down, or from the bottom up. It switches like that. So it's a little bit different how you point the arrow. So I want the arrow coming from the top, okay, pointing down. So that means the top are, um, I'm forcing both of these to be top aligned. If I do the bottom, the arrow comes from the inside out like that, it's, it's, it's different. So really subtle here, but if I do that, let's see if I let me do it. Okay, so now it, this this is constrained, or oh, I guess it didn't work. I'm not really good at this. But usually if I do that, then if I move this one, it controls this as well. Oh well, but anyways, so I'm gonna show you the radio buttons. Right now, they don't belong to a group. So if you are uh, familiar with radio buttons, if they are not belonging to a group, that means each button is independent, right? Right now, I have an ID called radio button. Let's call it one. This is radio button number. Um, yes, I renamed this to radio button number two. Okay, it's already named rat two. I call it rat too usually, but I'll leave it as this is fine. Okay, so if I refresh my app and I want to, oh, actually, I did not attach to activity two. I wanted to map to activity two. And we're going to rotate this back to where it was before, like that. I'm using the main two. So in my code, I want to change it to main two, okay? And then I'll just reload it again so that it uh, shows that main two with the radio buttons. There you go. As you can see, it looks like exactly how I want it, right? Because of the constraints. If they don't have those uh, um, lines, then it would be floated to the top or the bottom. But as you can see, if I click the radio button one or two, both are selected, right? Both are clicked. And because they don't belong to the same group, if they are belonging to the same group, the only one of those will be clicked or it will be selected or be checked, okay? So that is the idea about radio groups. Because they're independent, then if you want to perform something or you want to add an event to this button, you can do like we did last time, create a function and then add it to that control, right? For example, you go here, go to the attributes and um, on the click event, so again, this find click. And then right here, right? You can just I have two of them ready. I can, you know, choose go to target is fine.
So this one here is now linked to that. If I click on it, it will go there, even though it doesn't really make sense in this case. That is how you do using the on click. So again, this on click here is already attached to the inner class uh, a function called on click. You register directly to the control uh, via the UI or in code over here. Sometimes again, it's quicker to go into the code and just add the unclick and then add a target to the function, whatever it is. Okay. That approach is um, it's okay. You like that approach, that's fine. The other approach that I'll use for the uh, radio button number two, let, let, let's, let's rename this. This is two and this is one, okay, the text. I'm just put the text here, right? You can also get the text from the string. You can create one. So make sure you know how to do that as well, okay? Like over here on a string, I can go in and create a new one, right? And go and just control D, duplicate this. And I'll call this one here, rad, um, rad um, button one, and give it a name, like uh, button, I don't know, choice one. And then this is button two, and choice two, right? So you build your data here. Okay, and then your activities on the right side, and then in your code, let me hide these over here. You would just then the text instead of saying radio button, and you put at string, and then the name of that would be rad button one. Okay, so this is for rad button one, and the second one is at string rad button two. So now my data is coming from the string file. So I don't have to worry about manually go to my buttons and change here. I control my text in one place. Okay, again, back to the model view controller, right? So I actually prefer to do it this way. You have more control of your data. You know exactly where things go. And my layout, now it says, um, it should say, um, you know, Choice one and choice two, okay? So let me make it right here. Choice one and choice two. Okay. So now in my code for the main activity, and it's getting really messy now. So let's see. Let's go to the code, the main activity. And I'm going to target the button two, okay, because the choice one, we already map that to the on click, right? We already have it go to the target. The number two doesn't have any event yet. So this is how you do in the code. So you go here and, and the on create, you're going to create a um, radio button. So notice when you attach uh, from the view to the source, you don't need to create this button because you attach your function down here instead. Okay, but if you go from the source, you're gonna bind directly to an event listener. You have to know which button is it. So here we'll put a radio uh, button, call it rat two. Assign that to the bind by ID, r that ID that rat button two. So just like before, you create the reference, and then we're gonna bind it uh, through an unclick event because when I bind directly to that button. A radio button just between like a real, real, regular button. So you would do something like this. I'll put here rat2 dot, and if you type it on click, you have a, a, a lot of them, right? So the one you want to use is the set something, okay? The set on click event listener. So you want to have the one that says set on click listener, like that. If you double click on it, uh, if it doesn't complete it for you, usually it will complete, has a completion process for you. So again, if I, let me treat, let's see if I do it again. Like dot set on, okay, that's fine. That's what I, the one I want. I want to set a click event listener to this radio button. When I pass to this function, if you do a, if you put your mouse inside here, press the control space bar, and it will tell you some other options in here, okay? The one that we want is actually a view, um, uh, a view, and then we have a, a new view 
you on click listener had the same name okay if you double click on that one okay what it will do it will automatically if it's not doing that for you uh you will have it will force you to do it i'm gonna try again okay so again go to new view put a new object under the view class called on click listener usually the name here should always match the name over here it basically you move the set out of it right on click listener if you double click on it as you notice now it did not generate that callback function what that does is basically it says if you mouse over it says, hey you have to implement a method because it's an abstract class so if you click the implement methods here usually you click the one that says unclick is there's always going to be that one that's unclick here looks very familiar to this unclick over here right when we attach it directly to the view but if you do it from the code you have to do it this approach so select that and then just click okay and it will automatically complete that for you so this is the anonymous inner class it's an interface it's an abstract class but it allows you to generate object and the inside here you have to override this function on click whether you do anything in there or not it doesn't matter you have to override that right because it's an abstract function and then here is where you do the, your information so let's say for just for this example here i'm going to load a toast message okay there's a render a message to the uh, bottom of your screen so you call a function a class called toast and then uh dot make text okay and this function takes three things again control space bar will tell you um usually right here it says you have a context a string a string message and a duration an integer duration okay so the first context context mean is the current view so the current view or layout or view activity in this case is the main activity so you put main activity that class or that this the second is a string message you want to display to this layout or, or this activity so you put a string here like a um Hello, something like that and then the third is the length how long do you want this message to stay visible to the screen and i think there are two numbers you can put like a zero one but if you do like a, a zero means short okay a one is long but usually you don't want to put the number there you want to use what's called a toast dot and they have the length short or length long okay the long takes stays longer like almost like a uh, 10 seconds or even fewer and then disappears so that is how you create toast again toast if you don't in, uh, import it it's part of the widget class so up here because i put um it automatically imports it as you can see all of these are widgets right so instead of doing it this way you can remove all of these and just put a star here right so that you don't have to import every time when you create a widget okay it, it, it takes all the uh, subclasses out of the widget class, and then you have to you know, worry about importing. Shortcut. Okay, so that is um, how you do a um, event listener. Doing this way, you know, you are not creating your own function, so this is not reusable. Okay, it's only uh, associated or registered to that radio button or that button or that <laughs> control. Here, I can control. I can add it to any button. As you can see, I added to the radio button. I also add it to the regular button up here, right? So then we use it. So if you want to reuse an event, create your own function. Otherwise, do this approach. It's cleaner. It's actually more efficient this way. And you don't have to touch the view at all, okay? So let's save that and then uh, rerun our app and see if, um, if this works. Okay, so the first choice is gonna go to activity two. As you can see, and then we go back to the main. Okay, the second choice is gonna load a toast message. You see down the bottom. Um, oh yeah, right, it should, it should show up here. One thing I forget, and I always forget this, uh, is that you have to call the show function. Okay, you create the toast, but you will never show it. So um, let's, let's just do that first. After you create this, 
you can do, um, you can just attach the dot show, just chain it together, okay? The toast, you make the text, and then you have to show it. If you don't show it, it's not gonna be there. And you can make a separate line. You can show this letter, so you can create a toast object, and then show it later, right? You put like toast here. I'm just showing you, you don't have to do this toast, you know, T is equal to that. And then later on, I want to show it so T that show, and then we'll show that in the future. Um, okay, because I, mean, I don't want to show now. I can create this message first and then let it sit there and then show it later. Okay, so you can do that approach if you want to reuse that in the future. But usually, you know, you want to show right away, so you don't do that and just call it that show. Keep it the same line, different line, that's fine. As long as there's nothing in between, then it should still be fine. Okay, so let's go ahead and then uh, rerun this again. I'm gonna click just the show number two, choice two. And we should see this toast message down here in the bottom. Uh, there you go, like for oh, what, 10 seconds or even five seconds? Let's see. One, two, three, okay, three seconds. Uh, three seconds for the short. The long will be a little bit longer. But that is all for the toes. Okay, so I'm gonna do the, the log cat for, uh, very quickly here. The log cat is, again, for debugging purposes. So if you don't know what's going on inside here, um, you wanna track where the processing, the process is running, then you can put log cat. So let's say I'm inside the uh, click event. I put the message there. I can also put the log cat. Okay, yeah, the log and then the D. Okay, D is basically for um, displaying the string for data string. And there are many others as well, for integer, things like that. But the log D is the default one. Yeah, but the tag and then the actual message. Okay, the tag is you give it a name, like a key. In this case, is let's say um, my, this will be MSG for that. And you put the message here uh, on and, and on click. Function. Something like that, so you know where your code is because you cannot console log that to the, the log. If you do that, it's really hard to find. And I think I have to, um, it's a string, not a uh, character. If you import this in, I think, uh, you import the class. Okay. So you have a, a certain uh, key. You can put that message here. I can put that one there. I can add it onto the on start like this. So you put here, I'm inside the on start. There's some something okay. When I rerun my app again, let me try this if it works this or not. And then down here in the log cat menu, if you click on the log cat, and you can see all these messages as you run your app, it loads something you just don't see here. So what you do is in the variables on the right side of here in the search bar, you type the key that you add to the log, like. All my messages will go here. So you type in the MSG. And what you're going to see usually is that it's going to log all the messages for this uh, log cat. So instead of seeing all the other junks, I should only see my messages here. And if I'm not seeing it, I'm probably doing something incorrectly. Oh, I'm calling it the wrong API, right? The 30. It has to be the 30. You can't use the wrong one. We should pick the right one. So here we go. You can see that now. I filter out, that out. It only shows all the key that had the message in it. And then now it says I'm on start and on click now because I clicked that. If I click it again, it should show on click. Okay. If I go to target number two, nothing shows up. If I come back, it's going to say on start. Okay. So you can see I'm on start now. I'm waiting for an event. If I click on the event again, I'm inside that function on click. So again, just a way to debug your code, track your code machine, you know where uh, uh, where happens, and uh, for that purpose, mainly for that purpose. Okay, I'm sure you have other users too, but it's it's really useful. And you can have different type of messages in here. Okay. I put a message here because the string it doesn't be a text like that. It could be the actual value of a particular variable you want to pass here. I want to see what that uh, message is, what that um you know that the link or the text is you display right here. So you know what's going on, right? You can trace your code that way. That is basically that's it for the log cat, in case you're wondering. Okay, so we got that done. Now you can see that these two buttons are not 
in the group. So I'm going to change my view and I'm going to make them as um, radio group. Okay. So I think this is the view number two over here. Uh, let's close the emulator. Okay. So now I'm going to go and add a view group so that only one of those buttons will be clicked at any given time. Okay. So <clears throat> go up here to the buttons again and add the radio group right down here. As any, anywhere is fine. And then because the real group is not something you can see on the view, okay? it's just a container. And then what you want to do is you want to add these two buttons to that group. So you just drag it inside it like that. And so make sure they're nested inside. So now they belong to that group. Okay. So this group here has a name. You want to give it, I mean, ID. So if it doesn't have one, give it an ID. Uh, go to the code view or the other view is fine. And let's let's go to code. So here's the view group. <clears throat> Contains the radio buttons. And I want to give an ID, okay? So again, Android ID, the app ID, and get this one here, um, grab uh, group one, I guess, something like that is, is fine. <clears throat> but these two, still, they still have their own IDs. So I say that, I'm not sure what their radio, oh, has no constraint. Is it visible there too? I didn't think they are, but I guess they are. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. I guess they do have visibility. Weird. They are up here now because these two are, um, because once I move that into the group, it loses the constraint. So this guy has no constraint now. So let's move it down to the bottom, down here. Oh, I did the wrong one. I want to grab the group and it's kind of hard to move it down there. So I'm just going to do this. Chain it to the right. Chain it to the left and push it to the bottom. And then now push it to the top of this one here. Okay, and then give it a length of um, enough space to make sure they are in vertical. Uh, and then these guys, okay, now they have, they lost all the constraint, right? So I do it again to the right of the inner one. Oops, did that work? Yeah, I'm, I'm very bad at this. So let's see if we move it here. Oh, because yeah, the, the radio is not um is not a constraint, so I can I can constrain it inside here. Uh oh well. <clears throat> that's that's okay for now. <clears throat> I just want to demonstrate that. Okay, so you put that here, and then, so the event still attached to the same one. Okay, so if I, if I run it, it will still work just like before. Uh, I'm just want to make sure it's it is is correct. But this time, not really useful because if I click on it, it will still show. Um, you know, it still it will still show like before. Like choice two will show the little message down here, like same as before. Choice one will go to the other app and come back. So forth, right? So that's that's okay. I don't want to do that. But what I'm gonna do is that if I choose one or two, how do I know which one is clicked or selected? Okay. So I'm gonna go into the code and remove their information. Okay. So I'm gonna change the uh on click to off. So this has no registration for both buttons. And I'm gonna swap the two. Let's move it to the top. So the order here is kind of important. Okay, so now in my code over here on the main code, this is only for that radio button number two, right? So I'm gonna comment this out because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna target the group. So you create a group, so radio group, call it rack group, is equal to, just like before, find by ID, R that ID that radio group one, we call it group one. Okay. So now we're going to call a function to actually um, 
based on a select change uh, or check on any of those group inside the, the radio button. Because right now, if I'm not mistaken, I can only pick one of those buttons, right? So if, you, if I click on it, it should not load. You can see I can only pick one at a time because now they belong to a, a group of radio buttons, right? That's what radio buttons are, how, how they're used. They group together so the only one choice can be selected at any time. So when I choose one or two, it will turn that to be true or false based on the selection. So over here, I'm gonna call a function call. So it will register the group here are using the um, <clears throat> even listener, so radio group dot and do a set again. So here you have set on check change listener. Okay, it's a long one, but uh, this is the one I want to use. Is check the change listener for the radio button. Double click on that again. If it doesn't load, that's okay. We're gonna do a right click on it. I mean, control uh, space bar inside it, and let's see what it tells you. So. Um, the same as before, uh, but it's a it's a radio and not a view, right? It's a radio group, so you do something like, uh, you know, usually it will do that completion for you, but if you do it new, it will tell you. Same idea, right? On check change, remove the set. It's a radio group, so radio group here. Double click that again; it will look just like one above, except this is not a view; it's a radio group instead. <clears throat> They check the changes of any of these buttons. I have two of them. If any one of those is checked, then it changes, right? And then based on the check change, so this function will run automatically when you click a button in that group, okay? It will run automatically. And then whichever is selected or checked, its ID. So this ID here, red radio button one or radio button two, will be returned and assigned to this ID here. <clears throat> so you know exactly which one was selected. So if you had 10 of them, you don't have to worry because it will only return the one that has been selected. And this ID will always be that one. <clears throat> so let's say that if I pick choice one, I want to, uh, um, same as above, right? I want to load the message. If I choose, or, or I mean choice two, I want to go to the other activity. So how do you know which one is it, right? So you would do a check, okay? Um, so that means you would do something like this. If the, uh, well, I have to I have to check uh, first. I have to get the ID first. Um, so so let's 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 do this right above here. I want to do a, um, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna go up here, okay? I mean, I think you put it inside here too, but let's go over here. Put a radio uh, button, red one, just like before. Find the red ID, R dot ID dot button one, radio button one. And then you can duplicate that, Control V, and then change that to a two. So I know which one is which one. I still need to create a reference, okay? I did that because you know it's shorter when you code it. Otherwise, I could also just use this in my code, and I'll show you what, I'll show you what that means. <clears throat> so I know that one of these has been checked. It's based on this ID, but how do I know which one so I can call the correct function? or do it by certain thing, right? So you can check. If the check ID is, is equal to the radio one dot um, ID, Let's see if that works. If they match, then that means it's the first one that's clicked. So if I would do the toast, let me just copy the toast up here. So I don't need to type it again. Show the message. Else must be the second one, right? <clears throat> or it may not be. Oh, I mean, if you click on it, it wouldn't invoke. If you don't click it, it's not gonna invoke. So it has to be the second one. So 
In this case, I'm going to call the on start. And then, no, I'm sorry, uh, the go to go to um, target. So go to target and then we pass here the uh, group. No, not, not, not group, the, um, the red one, red two. I think that's going to be the view, yeah. Okay, so either matches the first one or second one, doesn't matter. And let's see if this works. This is only, I do that because if you want to reuse the radio, the radio one, radio two button again, okay? If you don't use it again, you can just basically call this directly right in here like this. But right? that's what I mean. You can do that right in here. Like that, okay? Because that will return the ID of that radio button as opposed to create one already and then call the get ID function to get the ID back. So it, it really depends how you want to do this. If I don't do anything with this radio button, then I'm not going to create them here. I'm just wasting uh, a memory, right? But let's see if this works, okay? So let's run this again. So the red one should show the, uh, the toast. You can see down here. Red two is going to go to the target number two, load the second activity, and it does. Okay, so basically that is it. So that's how you say radio buttons. And then if you were to do this for your um, assignment, you got these have text, right? This is the text here. Um, same thing with the buttons up here. I put the buttons here is the text. I, I could put like one, two, three, four here and get this value and then change that to a number and then do your uh, math operations, okay? And if I keep clicking that button, I'm gonna get the text. So you know how to get text already. And you will build uh, that text, add it to a chain of strings so you can display it. But you don't want you don't want to add them up. You just keep appending to that string. So if I click five, 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 I'm gonna get strings of five, and then you convert that to do the operation. Okay. I'm sure you don't do the job already. So so um, yeah, that's is pretty much it. So you can do this for the radio group if you want to do that route, or um, use this for um, the buttons. It does nothing run. Okay, it could be anything. It could be a text field. It could be a box. It could be the entire view. It doesn't matter because anything you click on it can trigger an event. Okay, so that's what that means when you do an event. But the radio group here is is very specific to that group only. It's it's a it's a only for that group. And next time we'll do the um uh like you do a spinner. You have the the grid view. You have the list view, and you select a particular uh element in that row or that record. It will trigger that as well. Something kind of similar. We use that the adapter um uh you to do that for you, but it would be the same idea. Okay, so I think that's all I want to cover today. Um, and again, the layout of the application I showed you earlier, mine is not the best. It's pretty ugly, uh, but I think you got the idea. The assignment is basically to, um, so I, I grade you based on your layout, okay? So make sure, you, <laughs> make sure this is logical. Uh, make sure these four operations work the, the way they should, okay? So here I'm just saying that now you can see I'm not giving you instructions anymore, okay? So basically you just build that app and to make sure it's working uh, it's performing those operations. You can use the ready buttons if you choose to do that. Um, I, I think I said to choose a layout, uh, uh, edit the input. Okay, so that means that um, you should be able to also edit the input. So that means the data you add to the view will be a edit text view. We add that. You click a number five, it goes to add it to the edit view, but I should, I should also be able to change those numbers as well for both uh, operands. Um, and then when I click the add button or subtract button or any of those um, submit button, if you use radio buttons, then you would get those two data and then do the operation accordingly and display that to the view as well, okay? Um, yeah, basically that's it. So it should be a, hopefully it's a fun exercise. It's gonna be creative, do like, uh, I don't know, um, what, square roots and all those stuff, go for it.
All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, any questions, let me know. And just don't talk to Fabian, okay? So I'll see you all next week.